coming to you live from above Ooh. the Heineken oh, no. River Deck. Well, thank you for rational thinking, man. I got you. Thank here. you so I much. Want the team player. Want All the of the arguments. Same people here. Richard is doing that as we uh, bring you the menu for this hour on, on the program here. It is time to get up with Patrick Mahomes. The Kansas City quarterback looks more and more like Superman each week, but one of our guys says San Francisco is bringing kryptonite to the Super Bowl. We'll explain then. The Niners didn't need their quarterback to win their game against Green Bay, which begs the question, if they do need him next week, is Jimmy G ready to be the hero? And then, Dame Lillard goes off, blows past 50, doesn't look back, while the Lakers implode in Boston. All of that and more as we get up with you starting right now in Portland. Warriors, Blazers, going to pick it up late in the first half. Richard Jefferson, Damian Lillard could not be stopped. No, he could not be stopped. And, and we talked earlier in the hour about look at that shot from that distance. We've seen him send people home from there. He was magnificent. Again, the, the range is ridiculous. Fourth quarter, seven is to play. Blazers down a deuce, and that's Lillard. Another three. He has 48 points in counting. But and, and what I love about this is this wasn't just like garbage time points. This was a man that needed this. You look at it down three here. Look at how hard he's working and the difficulty of that shot. It is so impressive. 54 points for Damian Lillard in regulation and those three send this one to overtime so he wasn't done yet. A minute to play in the extra session. Blazers down by three. Lillard another three from the top to give him 57. At this point you should just be sending five people at him doing whatever you can. That's too easy for a shot for a guy with 57. And then with eight seconds left, the Blazers up by three. Jordan Poole, no good. Lillard going to get the rebound. They're going to foul him, and he's going to go to the line with a chance to make two and get to 61 points on the night, which would be a new franchise record, and that he does. 61 points for Dame Lillard last night as the Blazers knock off Golden State in overtime, 129-124. Meanwhile, Richard, Lakers, Celtics in Boston. LeBron spent part of the day in Springfield, Mass, watching his son play in a high school game that made it in time for the game last night. Anthony Davis back from an injury, but Kemba Walker 0 for 28 career against LeBron. AD had a sort of a tough night. AD had a tough night. This was his first game back and it's going to take a little bit of a time for him to get his rhythm. Kuzma had been playing well. He didn't play well tonight because AD was back in my opinion and their just team just looked out of sort and this was the type of night for watch this the smallest guy on the court just accidentally tips it in over LeBron James. That's the type of night it was for them. When Kemba is going to make stuff like that happen it's just going to be the Celtics night that lead by three at the end of the first second quarter. Take a look at the fancy pass from Marcus Smart right there. Look at that and look I, I really like what Marcus Smart does on the defensive end and anything that he gives you on the offensive end and he's been shooting the ball well of late is an added bonus. That's a great pass behind the back later in the second Jason Tatum turning defense into offense. Look, I love the way the Celtics team is, is kind of constructed but they need all of their guys to play well in order for them to accomplish their goals. Third quarter Celtics leading by 16 and it's Brown. Oh, he's going to get a technical for taunting LeBron. As he should. Put him in a body bag, young fella. When you get the dunk on one of your heroes, you know what you do? You get a technical. You know why you get a technical, Greeny? Because they're going to keep showing the replay over and over again during the game. So you get an extra, like, 30 seconds because they got to do the technical. Do you think Danny Ainge even really noticed? It wasn't obvious there. Celtics and Kemba, a big win. I mean, listen, it was just a good old... Good old old fashioned bubble, and that's all. That's all. They beat us on all facets of the game um, from the outside, the interior, um, points off turnovers, and offensive rebounds was the main ingredients of this L. I'm happy I got one at least, you know, before he, before he goes. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's only one. One in 28. <laughs> you know, that's it. Thank you, Kevin. Thank it's you, the buddy. latest. Thank you. <laughs> I'm one in, I'm on a new team, so I'm one in oh. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he was 0 for 28 against uh, LeBron in his career. Sherman Douglas was 0 for 30 against Michael Jordan. That was <laughs> the all-time record for Sherman that kind of humiliation. So what do you make of that last night? Lakers, I mean, it's, it's sort of a big day. It's a big day, the holiday and everything else, and, and they go out and they lay that kind of an egg. Uh, look, look, I, I think there was, you know, obviously LeBron James was, you know, seeing his son, and I agree, you should 100% see your kids whenever you get the opportunity to. But I think this was one of those games that as, as a player, you're like, Maybe we need to relock in. You get Anthony Davis back. Kyle Kuzma had been playing well, but now there's an adjustment getting Anthony Davis back and just the amount of touches. But and this is a Boston team that was hungry. Everyone knows the Lakers are going to come after.
after them. But the Boston team had been struggling the last few games. And so for LeBron James to come into town, a little extra incentive, it's on MLK. So I think that's just, it was a one game situation. But I do believe that the Lakers need to refocus and relock in. Yeah, you know, I mean, the season is so long and, and all of that. And Anthony Davis coming back. To me, it feels like it's a little less about the Lakers. It, it, this may surprise you than it is about the Celtics. Yeah. I mean, the Celtics have, have not played well over the last couple of weeks. But if there is a team that I think is the most dangerous to Milwaukee in the Eastern Conference, I, I, I'm going to die on this hill. I believe it's going to be Boston. And 100% it is Boston. I'm not a big fan of the way Philly plays. I just saw them play against the Brooklyn Nets. And I love this Boston team. They have so much perimeter talent. But all of this perimeter talent has to play well. So chemistry, continuity, all of these things are going to be big for them down the stretch. Look, the problem is, is that they have to play great. If they play good, they can't beat Milwaukee. But if they play great and Milwaukee just plays okay, they can come out of the East. So an interesting night in the NBA last night as Dame Lillard goes for 61 and the Celtics blow out the Lakers. Laura Rutledge, let's go to the Super Bowl. Let's get there. We're 12 days away from it, so we got to talk about it. Some key storylines, and according to ESPN's Football Power Index, the Chiefs have a 65% chance to win the game. FBI also says this is the best pregame matchup quality of any game in the last two seasons. The 49ers allowed 19.4 points per game during the regular season, an improvement from the 27.2 they allowed the year before. In fact, that improvement, the largest in the NFL. Patrick Mahomes will go up against that defense. He has nine passes passing and rushing touchdowns this postseason. That's the most by any player without committing a turnover. No surprise, his coach Andy Reid likes him. He's great to be around every day because he brings energy every day. We respect that. He's never given it. It's about me. I've never heard that from him. It's all 100% about the team and how we're doing and what can we do better, where can I help. Buckles down to get the game plan down. I mean, he studies. And for young young guys out there, what a great example that is uh, about hard work. He's not the fastest guy in the world, but you see him know when to do that, know when to run, know when to get down, know when to throw it. For a young guy, I mean, it's special. He's a special kid. Yeah, so basically Patrick Mahomes has never had a bad game. So if you are the opposing defensive coordinator, <laughs> coordinator in this case the 49ers, what defense are you in? Like, how do you try and limit Mahomes? A lot of people are going to say, look, you need to throw a lot of different looks at him. And what you do, San Francisco is one of the best blitzing teams um, in the league. But I think this is – this boils down to players. Like, for me, and, and that's what we're going to talk about – until this game. To me, this is about players. I went back and I said earlier, you look at the Carolina Denver Super Bowl, it was about DeMarcus Ware and Von Miller and Wolf, those guys up front creating havoc to get in Cam's way and create pressure and turnovers and sacking them and making sure that you keep him uncomfortable all the time. They are capable. San Francisco is capable of rushing the passer at an elite level. Now, look, if I'm Salah, like, I'm not going to let him just sit. I'm not going to go into this game like four guys going to rush and we're going to figure out how to get seven in coverage. No, sometimes I'm going to throw five. Sometimes I'm going to throw six. I'm going to hurry him up. I'm going to give Patrick Mahomes everything I, get, I can give him within the comfort of what we do. I think one mistake defensive coordinators make, they want to reinvent themselves when they get – a great player. They want to figure out, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make sure that we do it. That's not what you do. What you do best is you let these four rushers get after it and you bring pressure at the times where you want to bring pressure. That's the best game plan. And if Salah can do that and have success, he'll be the hottest yeah. name in coaching. That's why I think like this game honestly kind of like kickstarts a big time legend for Patrick Mahomes because you referenced the Cam Newton versus Denver, right? And Cam was on this meteoric rise yep. for his career at MVP. And all of a sudden, that game got, you know, he got stunt, stumped by that defensive line. Tom Brady versus the Giants. Great offense. And then you play against the defensive line that can bring four. And it's all of a sudden like, wow, that is the one way yep. to slow down or stop these, these elite, great, dominant quarterbacks. And if Mahomes can go and conquer the 49ers defensive line, then it's like, wow, this guy is one of the best that no we've question. ever seen already in two years. And I'm with you, man. Like, if, if, if San Francisco thinks that they're just going to try and figure, you know what, we're not going to let Mahomes sit back in the pocket. We're going to play man coverage, because I, I know you think this. We're going to play man coverage and come after him. 
it's a you're you're it's a death sentence yeah. he will write it for you so you better do what you do really well you better go to armstead and buckner and bosa and d ford and go listen we made strategic moves and we drafted we went through lean years yeah. san francisco went through lean years and didn't draft the quarterback early because they wanted to invest in the defensive line and they did it for this moment and those of you that have to be the guys that have to slow down and stop Mahomes for them to have a chance to win this Super Bowl. But you're going to have to have some wrinkles, and you got to heat them up early. When you want to rush up a quarterback's process, you got to get body blows early in the game. And it's not about how many yards you give up. You got to get Mahomes on the ground and let him start here in footsteps. You talk about Cam Newton, Von Miller, and what DeMarcus Ware is able to do. They were able to put him on the ground early and let him know that he's coming. And then they start hearing ghosts. You know, they start seeing ghosts. You know, not, not a shot to Sam Darnold, uh -oh. but they start seeing ghosts <laughs> later in the game. So Salah's going to have to do some self-scouting and make sure that he doesn't get thing. in a steady dose of the same thing. Here's the thing. If you heat him up, sounds like a good plan. He's the best quarterback in the NFL outside the pocket. So you know if you pressure. And set those it, edges, baby. But if, they, but if you don't, if you don't set that edge and you let him outside the pocket, it's a wrap. He's the best guy but in the secondary two, is not built but, to cover long. But your two best players are where? On the well, perimeter. So you put it on them. Sure. If you want to you you know, expose our edge, you better retrace and you better be but, humming. But, but here's the deal. The, something's going to break. That's the conversation you and Bart are having. You got the best blitz team against the best quarterback against the blitz. Right. Something is going to break. That's why I go back to the foundation of football since the beginning of time. If you got four bad guys up front that can handle business and create havoc on their own it frees up everything you want to do that's why pass rushers make a hundred million dollars right. that's why was, they get paid like quarterbacks when was the last time you might know better than me when, when was the last time we saw a quarterback have to face like a dominant dominant defensive line like this and beat him i can't re I, in my brain i can't remember a quarterback when he faced this kind of defensive line me neither whoop him I mean, Newton lost in, to Denver that right. time. Brady, you know, against the Giants, the, the Giants those couple of times. Let me give it some thought. Jump in with the next quarterback we'll talk about here, and I will come back to you. Yeah. With that. Let's do it. Okay, that other quarterback is Jimmy Garoppolo, who hasn't really had to do much this postseason. In fact, in Sunday's win against the Packers, Jimmy G attempted a grand total of eight passes. So, look, it'd be quite a shock to see a repeat performance like that from Jimmy G in the Super Bowl, as there's very little precedent for playoff success with so few pass attempts. In fact, since 1950, only five players have thrown seven or fewer passes in a playoff win, and no one has done it since Bob Greasy back in 1973. So, that begs the question, as I continue to ponder what you've asked me here, and I, I'm thinking <laughs> of the legendary defenses that have won these championships. The other side of it is, you know, they're playing against the legendary quarterback. We don't know exactly what the quarterback of San Francisco is now. Jimmy G, we know that when he plays, they win, and when he doesn't, they lose. So that tells us something. But if they need to put this game on his shoulders, how confident are you that he wins it? I'm about 70%, G, <laughs> and the only reason is because I saw him in New Orleans in a tough environment, a tough place to play, a playoff-like atmosphere, and Drew Brees was cooking as well and scoring points, and he was able to continue to answer the bell. That's all we really have to go off of. So I'm not going to say that Jimmy G can't do it, but I don't have a full boat of confidence. I think 70 is pretty good when you think about the fact that he hasn't had to be as effective as most quarterbacks in the NFL throwing the football. I mean, can he do it? Yes. But it's only if that run game is going because most of his shots are going to come off of play action. If that, if he has a drop back where he struggles, his QBR is like 34, you know, when he drops just straight drop backs and everybody has eyes on him, he's not a guy that I think is going to go through his progressions and continually to carve you up. He's a guy that's going to, if you, if you suck up those linebackers with play action, that old, those RPOs, he can hit you behind, you know, the, the, you know, hit you behind the linebackers in front of the safeties and guys like Debo, Debo and guys like Emmanuel Sanders can get that yak afterwards. I don't see him throwing these 60-yard bombs, these beautiful well, you know, aerial. I, I think it's important to understand that it, whether the run game is working or not, Kyle's going to call play-action pass, and it's just as effective if they're gutting defense with the run game or not. We have data that proves that. Two, he's got the best QBR passer rating in football when trailing this season. Three, we all point to the New Orleans game, as we should, but there were other games this year. Arizona, the second time they play Arizona, I think they go down 17-0, come back and win that game. Seattle at the end of the game, come back in the year, come back and win that game. 
game. So Jimmy G, we've kind of forgotten about the regular season because of what has happened in the postseason, and they haven't had him yeah. or needed him to throw the football. We all sit here and talk about Kyle Shanahan and how great Kyle is, and we talk about how great he is with the run game. He's the same dude that's going to be dialing up the pass game as well. I know Kyle. I played under Kyle. Kyle's had off top passing offenses no matter what his quarterback has been. So, therefore, if they need to make a rally in the second half, I trust Jimmy G because I trust Kyle Shanahan and I trust Kittle and I trust that play action pass. Well, see, it's so a, oh, go ahead. He's at 100% there. Here's my question for you. I'm not I trying know. to say that Jimmy G is Tom Brady, but when Tom Brady has had to, he's thrown 15 passes if he's needed to. He's thrown 40. Yeah. Is Jimmy G that guy that is one of those great quarterbacks who can just, depending on what the defense gives him, bring what he's going to bring in a game? I think it was a great question. I, we don't know. Like, uh, I have one game that I'm basing this off of, and I know you're talking about the other ones. What I remember from this season, this is my, this is my view of Jimmy G. Two-minute drill against Seattle, and it should have been an interception to end the game. And the dude, and, and I think Wagner dropped that one. Right. He came back, and it should have been another interception. And the linebacker dropped that one. And I'm like, Jimmy G was terrified in a crunch time situation against Russell Wilson. And then we come back a couple weeks later in New Orleans, and I see him dealing. Right. And I'm like, okay, so who is the guy That's ultimately fair. when you put him in these? We talk about pressure pack situation. We, we, yeah, we talking about the amount of pressure that Pat Mahomes is going to put on Jimmy Garoppolo, depending on how this San Francisco defense does. Can he continue to deliver enough to keep up with what Pat Mahomes Holmes has the possibility of doing. But this is why we said the same thing about Nick Foles two years ago, and we hadn't seen it on Nick Foles. And I tried to tell everybody it's not just him. It's the play caller. It's the people around him. It is a collaborative effort. And that's why, 100%. like, if, if he had a play caller that was just pedestrian, mm -hmm. it'd be a different story. But who shut down those great New England um, Patriots? Well, I mean, Giants. in one game you did, Spagnola, the Giants right? did their yeah. pass. Spagnola, right? right? Yeah. So he's on the other side, too. So give him his credit and his yeah. just due. All right. One other thing we wanted to get to here, and that is if you were watching at the end of our previous hour, these two guys were shouting at each other over the <laughs> possibilities involving Dak Prescott, who does not have a contract in Dallas, as you well know. And there is certainly the possibility at this point that he will wind up being franchised or the Cowboys will try to put the franchise tag on him. But that's something that he has to sign voluntarily and Marcus Spears suggested that he should not Bart Scott suggested that perhaps Dak should consider taking less money disappointed so they can continue to put good players around him and just unbridled insanity ensued <laughs> gentlemen I will let you pick it up wherever you would like go ahead Bart. well I was just disappointed in the fact that you believe that a quarterback should take all the money you know, you play defensive line. We've all sacrificed money so we can go out and get other players. Dak Prescott, Ooh. listen, Dak Prescott is going to get more than one more bite at the apple. We saw Russell Wilson come in in a similar situation, win a Super Bowl, not take the top of the market, right? Dak Prescott is not a $40 million quarterback. I understand the market may dictate that, but we always want to sit up here and give the credit to Tom Brady for taking less. Why has he been able to perform at such a high level for so long? Because he takes less money so he can get more pieces, so he can have the opportunity. Because if Dak wants to max out his contract, he needs to get some wins, some playoff wins, some Super Bowl wins on his resume. To do that, he's going to need a lot of good players. Did you he say may the lose same thing about Super. Tony Romo? Tony Romo? Well, listen, he, took, listen. he didn't take less money. And he didn't win nothing. But he he, 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 win nothing, he didn't though. take less money, though. Yeah, and he didn't win nothing, so okay. you're proving my point. So, so, Bart, let me ask you this question. Sure, actually. You're talking about Dak Prescott taking less money yep. in order for, for the Cowboys to be in a great situation. Yeah. Right now, we're about to watch in a week a quarterback that got $100 million after six games. Mm hmm that's about to be in the Super Bowl. So how are you forecasting that Dak taking less money means the Cowboys are better? Because, I, you, listen, it gives him, it gives him, listen, he can still get. They just gave Jared Goff $100 million, right? Correct. Are we, I'm not saying he's not going to get $100 million. Listen, $100 million go a lot farther in, in Bart, Dallas than it goes up here. Bart, you telling them, you, first of all, $35 million. you're not going to agree on this, so it's belaboring the point. You are telling me that Dak Prescott should take less money because the Cowboys are going to be in a better – that ain't his job. His job to, is to play quarterback and at win a games. high level, and win, games. win games, and how do you win paid. games? You just told me you win games with players. Well, you, look, you need me, money to get players. Let like, me ask the quarterback. Can't take all the cheese off the taco. Let me ask one quick question. Is there something wrong with a system 
in which a player should be, should someone should be pressuring. I understand what you're saying. Right. There should be pressure on a player to take less money than he otherwise could in order for his team to succeed. That's a great question. And yes, there's something wrong with that because especially in that case where you've been underpaid and you have overperformed or outperformed your contract, now it's unfair somewhat to Dak Prescott to sit back and go, Man, I sh I, I'm going to get less than X player even though I've outperformed X player. 35. He can get $35 million. Win, win, win a Super Bowl, go back and get more money. I'm with you. I'm with you. But you And I've said, don't play, pay a good player. Bro, great player we money. don't know if he's going to win a Super Bowl if he takes $5 <laughs> million less. This but is the second time chance. this conversation he got a less chance with Amari Cooper not on the team. Roll something. Coming up on Get Up, Joe Burrow may have had the best season of any quarterback in the history of college football. Would the Bengals even consider trading that top pick? We'll talk about it. And James Harden kept shooting and kept missing. The Rockets are thunderstruck after a late game collapse. Is it time to panic in Houston? Answers to those questions and more. Get up on ESPN. <laughs>